Hello, my name is Sarah Dunant. Uh, I'm a novelist writing within the Italian Renaissance and a historian. And for the last three years, I've also been an art society lecturer, uh, a job which has proved wonderful for me because it's enabled me to combine my love of art with my love of history and offer, I hope, a little insight into the way uh, a novelist uses art to try and bring the past to life, in this case, the Italian Renaissance. And the online lecture I want to give you today is to celebrate a city uh, at its, a great city, at its probably its greatest moment in history. The city is Venice, and I'm going to try and bring it to life by showing you two paintings, which I'm not going to tell you about now. I'd like them to arrive as a surprise, so you're going to have to watch me for just a minute longer. So when you think of Venice now, I'm wondering what words come to mind. It's certainly a very beautiful and a romantic city, but it's also a doomed city, a city we feel sorry for because it is actually quite literally gradually sinking under the waves. Well, 500 years ago, nobody felt sorry for Venice. She was not sinking, she was ruling. She had a Mediterranean empire, she was a hub of trade between the East and West. I could show you a dozen paintings which would bring alive Venice through the buildings or the waters, but instead I'm going to show you a portrait, because when I stood in front of this picture at the National Gallery, I knew that I was seeing more than just a person, I was actually seeing a state. It's a portrait of Doge Loredan, the head of the Republic of Venice, in the year 1500, which is the sort of date that we believe this really terrific painting was done by Giovanni Bellini, the most preeminent painter in Venetian society at the time. And I want you to just look at it for a moment. What do you see here? Power, yes. Wealth, certainly. Even luxury. Confidence. Dignity possibly a, a touch of benign wisdom, but there's no arguing with his authority, his unassailable position. Because this is not just a portrait of a man, it's a portrait of a state. Don't mess with me, don't mess with Venice. This is art as beauty, but also art as propaganda. It is in all ways a brilliant painting. I don't think any photograph could achieve what Bellini has done here in terms of portraying a likeness and giving both depth and poetry a kind of aura of magnificence. And that skill in the painting is in itself a reflection of something of Venice's own artistic history. Giovanni Bellini is an accomplished master and he's painting at the height of his powers. He's probably around the age of 60 when he does this. Uh, he's been famous for quite a while, but he's also running a workshop in Venice, uh, which is attended by people like Giorgione and soon by a young Titian. But what's also important about this painting is the medium in which it's painted, because Bellini is using oil. Now, at this time, obviously, throughout much of Italy, fresco was very popular. But oil had come to Venice some decades before, originally from Northern Europe, probably in the hands of the painter Antonella da Massina, and Bellini had taken it up big time. Oil suits Venice very well. It's a, a city with a certain level of dampness in it because of the amount of water, and frescoes need time to dry. But oil can be used on canvas or on wood, which means you also don't need to paint it in the church in situ. You could also paint it uh, in your own studio. But there's something else about oil, which is the quality of the paint on the canvas creates a very different impression. It, it has a level of detail and a level of clarity to it. And there is a real shining brightness to the way it brings out color. If you think about fresco, the color is much softer and smokier. And this color, I think, this kind of painting really suits Venice at the time, because of course what it does is to capture a certain quality of light that Venice is famous for. You can go deep into oil from getting lost in that shining blue background to the precision of the detail. The quality of the painting of the Doge's costume, for instance, 
You can see every stitch, every pattern, even down to each of those buttons on his robe. See how they're covered in thread. If Venice is a city of trade in luxury goods, that includes cloth, then Bellini's Doge is also an advertisement, part of a fashion shoot. So much for Venice dressed. Uh, now let's start to unclothe her. Because there is one commodity that this city is also famous for around this time, and that is sex. Of course, sex is in demand everywhere you go in history, but at this particular time in Venice's history, this is not about common or garden prostitution. This is about something rather more fitting to a city of wealth and luxury. But to understand it, you have to know a little bit about Venice's government. She is as successful as she is as a state, partly because she is very secure and has been for a long time a stable government, unlike many places in Italy which rest on quite fragile dynasties which can be invaded or overtaken. Venice's form of government is a republic which is really an oligarchy, which means that the government, the Senate and the Doge are drawn out of a set of families who have been in power for many centuries by the time of the Renaissance. They are always only a finite group of families and they guard that power very powerfully by making sure that you can only join if your name is in quite literally a golden book of noble families which is kept in the Doge's palace. So if you are a legitimate son at the age of 18 you will write your name in that book and will be eligible for government. But we're in a period of economic expansion. More children are surviving through childbirth. And one of the things that Venice doesn't want to do is to make those families grow too big because then the whole edifice of government becomes too unwieldy. So there is a decision taking place at this time that families will limit the number of children that they have who can get married and therefore pass on privilege to their children. This is easy enough with women. Uh, whenever you have um, redundant too many daughters in a family, you can shove them into a convent. That's a whole other lecture. But the men, of course, are not going to be quite so compliant. Uh, they don't want to be cut off from real life. They may be happy not to get married, but they would like the trappings of family life, and that will include a lovely home and a compliant, if not wife, then mistress. Now, these are not men who want to go into the back streets for prostitution. They would like to be with women who have a kind of culture and a kind of standing in the world. And it is at this moment that, along with all those rich merchants in Venice, a demand for a different kind of prostitution grows up, a demand for high-class courtesans. And here, art just fell into my lap. This painting in the Uffizi is now known as the Venus of Urbino because it ends up in the bedroom of the Duke of Urbino. But it was actually painted in Venice in the 1530s in the studio of Titian. There's lots of discussion as to what exactly is the meaning in this painting. Some think it might be a marriage painting. The Duke had recently got married and perhaps he bought it to give to his wife. The young woman kneeling with the maid next to her in the back of the painting might be a symbol of housekeeping or unpacking her dowry chest. Certainly that view out of the window identifies it as Titian's studio because we know where his house was in Venice at the time. And the naked woman might be a symbol of union between man and wife and even the dog might be an image of fidelity. But no one really knows. What we do know by studying Titian's letters is this lovely, arresting young model was a courtesan. We actually know her name. Her name is Angela Zavetti, and we know a little bit about her, which is that she began life in Rome, where uh, the Catholic Church, in a very corrupt stage, had a law of celibacy for those who worked in its administration, but that didn't always mean chastity, so high-class courtesans had quite a good living in Rome. But in 1527, an imperial army sacks Rome and many of those courtesans flee and Venice 
is where they come to. So what do we know about Angela Zavetti? She would have been of humble birth. Obviously, this is not a job for a woman born into one of those noble families. On the other hand, she would not have been totally uneducated. Quite often, courtesans were managed by their mothers who'd been courtesans before them. And they would have had a level of education. They would have also quite clearly have been beautiful. They would have started their life young, uh, probably around the age of 14 or 15, or, although that may sound rather shocking, you should remember that that's the age where young women regularly got married at this time. And that would have meant that they would have had at least 15 or 20 years of professional life ahead of them. They would have been quite cultured. Many of them would have played the lute. Uh, they would have held entertainments for their clients. And uh, some of them actually wrote poetry. We know of one who uh, composes a discourse on the philosophy of love. And they would have lived in, in quite luxurious settings because their house and the things in their house would have been paid for by a number of clients who would visit them. And that would have fitted very well with the young men or the merchants of Venice who would have loved to have gone to a house which was cultured and was beautiful and artistic. So that would have been the world of courtesans in Venice. But this painting also has a rather special place in the journey of art history. Up until the last half of the 15th century, the only acceptable image of a naked woman in art, in an art dedicated to religion, had been Eve, and no good came of her beauty. But with the Renaissance and the revival of classical art and classical mythology, Venus starts to emerge, most notably to us, in her birth with Botticelli in the 1480s, and then through a number of naked women. Many of them come out of that Venetian school. Many of them indeed trained in the studio of Bellini, who did the Doge. Most notably, Giorgiano's Sleeping Venus. You can look it up online. And Titian himself, who produced some luminous female figures before this, both dressed and undressed. In all these, the young, naked women are while pursuing beauty also offering a refined enjoyment for the male gaze, while they appear themselves to be, well, either asleep or looking away or looking in a mirror, not aware of it. But this lady, this lady is looking right back at us. And it feels like she's saying, you like what you see? You want to make me an offer? I think there's a mixture of confidence and mischief in the way this young woman is looking at us. And it certainly made me really interested in writing about a character like her. Indeed, that scene is dramatised in a, a novel I wrote about courtesan culture in Venice. But Angela Zavetti is um, a, a rather classic figure because, like many, she would have become very useful for artists like Titian. We know he painted her many times, not just naked, also with clothes on. If you look up online and see La Bella, you will see her very beautifully dressed and that lovely impish face uh, shows very well in clothes as well as without. We know that Titian was um, very fond of her, uh, not, I think, sexually. He was very happily married at the time. But we also know that those dinners that she might have attended were attended by another man who was uh, a good friend of Titian's, a satirist and a writer called Pietro Aretino. And he's a very interesting figure because he gives us a real glimpse into courtesan life at this moment. He writes a, a, a letter which later becomes public to Angela Zavetti, with whom he's having a relationship at the time. And if you look at her uh, as I read you what he says, I think you'll get a sense of what the man, or a man at the time, would think made a really good courtesan. So look at her as I read you this. My lady. You employ cunning with such skill that whoever spends money on you swears he is the gainer. You share out so beautifully your kisses, your fondlings and your bed that no one is ever heard to quarrel or curse or complain. You have no taste for feminine tittle-tattle. You do not see suspicion where it isn't or create jealousy where it was unheard of. Your ways are honourable and your sweet beauty most rare and splendid. And for that reason, I have given myself to your ladyship 
because you are worth it. This lovely young woman reclining as a naked Venus will make her way through art history now. The same pose done by many different painters. You will have seen them in art galleries and museums, I'm sure. And I think you could even argue that she probably ends up somewhere in the 1960s in sort of centerfolds in Playboy. But she also seeded herself uh, that beauty of a body and that beauty of a face within the minds of Venetian painters who would come after Titian. I'm thinking particularly of people like Veronese and Tintoretto, who both clothed and unclothed would explore the beauty of Venice's women and would give us some of the most luxurious portraits of the time. As for what she was selling, well, that would go on to be a popular commodity in Venice for a long time to come. You can read travellers' tales into the next century of men coming to do their shopping, and that their shopping might include a little bit of sex. Money, power, sex. Some of these things stay constant within history, but also some of them, at certain moments, give us really great art. Thank you very much for listening.